Hey everyone, welcome to another On This Day in Canadian Military History live stream. I had one yesterday, I have one today, so it's good to do back to back on the weekends and uh, talk about some good some good stories. So today is going to be kind of a freewheeling discussion uh, as what happens when me and today's guests get together. That happens. <laughs> it's happened on this channel, it's happened other places. We just get talking and it's good times. So today it's going to be about uh, the history of the Black Watch. Um, the Royal Highland uh, Regiment of Canada. So it's uh, one of the most prestigious uh, regiments, one of the oldest. Uh, so lots of interesting stories to be told. And again, as always, if there's questions, especially for those who don't know too much about the other history of this, because this unit has been around for, like I said, a long, long time, various conflicts, fire away, and uh, we'll, we'll do our best. So we're going to do kind of a rough kind of chronological order uh, about the, the unit and all that stuff. Uh, and excited today for the today's guests, uh, second appearance on the channel. I'm sure there's going to be many, many more. <laughs> uh, and uh, But today's just uh, kind of fitting for the calendar. So that's kind of why we're doing it this weekend. So it's, it's going to be an interesting one. So we'll have David O'Keefe, who's always got lots to say and in a great way he does it. So we're I'm really looking forward to it and having him on today. Good afternoon. Hey, how's it going? Good, how are you? Good, good, good. Thanks for coming on again. I uh, appreciate oh, my it. Pleasure. Yeah, it's uh, it's great to have you on here and talking again. Uh, no D up today, guys. Sorry. Uh, no, well, no. It'll come up a little bit. It always does. Uh, well, technically, technically, they were there. Black Watch were there, so okay. <laughs> they technically, we're there. Uh, but anyway, uh, like I said, you've been on before. We talked about uh, yeah. Black Watch, Second World War, Normandy, and Barrier Ridge. We're going to try and not talk about that too, too much because we already did. Uh, and I think I linked it down below anyway, so you can watch that after. Uh, that one's more of a case study of what happened in Normandy. But today, um, we're just going to talk about generally because it's the 160th anniversary was on Monday? 31st. Tuesday? Yeah. Yep, 31st. Yeah. So not that long ago. So again, this was your idea. So thanks again for coming up with it. I didn't even no. cross my mind. I've been so busy lately with everything. <laughs> I just totally blipped on this that you are a Blackwatch story. <laughs> it's just completely skipped my mind. Um, so I'm glad you, uh, you came up with the idea and reached out. So as we were talking about before, we're going to probably talk about Second World War. It's probably going to get a good chunk of the talk. But yeah. kind of setting up this origins of the regiment, I think, is important, again, to understand that. Because there's a lot that goes into this regiment that a lot of people, like you were just saying, people in the regiment today have no idea. And yeah, it's that's kind what of important when you how the regiment a, develops. That's what happens when you have a history that stems, you know, stretches back 160 years. There's a lot of it. I mean, there was a lot of stuff I learned when I, you know, when I joined 30 years ago and I started right. looking into the history. I mean, the, the first, you know, 40 years, 45 years of the regiment is kind of tumultuous. Um, not known as the Black Watch when they started. They were the fifth, uh, what is it, the fifth Royal Light Infantry. They were formed in 1862. And of course, that was, you know, coming out of the scare of, spillover of the american civil war and then following up following that then you had the fenian raids in the you know mid 19 or 1860s i should say yeah. so there was a, a a galvanization of uh, of um, a, a military spirit at that time and of course mm -hmm. you know those were the days when if you had the money you can go out and field your own regiment you know so <laughs> uh, you know that's prohibited now uh, from my understanding thankfully um, but it was one of those things where if you were wealthy enough and you could underwrite it, that's certainly what you did. And that's basically where the Black Watch got started. Some of the um, some of the very heavy movers and shakers, mostly, well, in the Scottish community in Montreal, which was um, a very wealthy and very powerful community in Canada, yes. not just in Montreal. I mean, we, you know, we tend to forget that Montreal, um, you know, probably up until about 50, 60 years ago was the mover and shaker of Canada, um, mm -hmm. the way Toronto is right now, center of the universe, all roads <laughs> led there. So, you know, over the years, you have people connected with the regiment, whether it's foundation or throughout that were, you know, captains of industry, they were politicians, mm -hmm. they were professionals, you know, the, the family that one of the families that's associated with it, you know, throughout is the Cantley family yeah. that were associated with, I believe it was the Grand Trunk Railway. And, you know, the Bank of, uh, you know, the, the Bank of Montreal and, mm -hmm. you know, all these things that are considered to be, you know, blue chip institutions in the country. So that's, you know, basically their foundations. And mostly it was for the Scottish, you know, the Scottish members, but they recruited from the Anglophone working class areas. 
Mm -hmm. And so you, Montreal at that time was, I'd say, much more heavily Anglophone than it is now. Um, it was never an Anglophone city. I mean, it was decidedly yeah. both for the longest yeah. time. But it was, you know, there were there were many areas that, you know, for instance, if I tell you that, you know, the Anglophone enclaves were Verdun and Rosemount, that, you know, they're almost unilingual Francophone now. Yeah. Um, so you can see how much the, it's changed. But you know, that's what they were recruiting from. The 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 officers were drawn from the Golden Square Mile of Montreal. In other words, the you know, the ring around Mount Royal, um, where you get the the Bromfmans and everybody else living in this day and age, you know. And um, so yeah, it was a very well healed regiment to start with. And you can also imagine the kind of expectations, you know, that, that <laughs> old family, old money oh, expectation yeah. that came with it. Yeah. yeah, and that's that's a theme I think that runs through their history. Uh, I mean, we talked about that before. We talked about that on the last show as well. Yeah. That they have this, uh, there's this expectation of, I guess you could use the word greatness, right? To to always reach, yeah, uh, high level. And, yeah, I've 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 likened it in the past, and you know, I wrote it in my book, and I said it's 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 kind of like sports, a sporting franchise yeah. where you're the Montreal Canadiens, New York Yankees, Manchester United. There are expectations. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm a big Habs fan. Forget about this year. Um, yes. But anyway, there are serious <laughs> expo you know, expectations. And that was what it was like with the Black Watch, not so much before the First World War. Right. But the First World War is the big coming out party. Yeah. You know, they, they go off and they recruit the most battalions that any infantry regiment has ever put in the field which is three yeah. um the 13th battalion was the first one in battle in 1915 then followed uh, not long later by the 42nd and then later on very briefly the 73rd which lasted for about a year year and a bit yeah something like that. but their claim to fame all three of them were standing sh essentially shoulder to shoulder um at vimy mm -hmm. you know in 1917 which is you know, something that goes into this incredible um, uh, treasure chest of of history and memories for the, you know, for the regiment itself, not to mention, you know, all yep. the individual honors and battle honors. Well, yeah, and I was sorry, the, the word individual just makes popped into my head uh, and mm. some good PR never hurts. Uh, <laughs> and they had one of the best, <laughs> I would say, in Canada in the First World War with, with Will Byrd. I mean. Oh, God, yeah. I mean, yeah, his... but it was, yeah, and more than that too, because remember, a lot of them, you know, a, a lot of the men who came back. I mean, one of the things, if you if you ever get a chance, and you, you know, once COVID's done, and we get back to normal, um, the Black Watch have one of the best archives. They, them and mm -hmm. I think the Calgary Highlanders are fantastic, um, but uh, the Black Watch have an incredible one, particularly from World War One, because mm -hmm. they have uh, Featherstone's papers and uh, Topps papers. And right. I think Top wrote about the 42nd, Featherstone about the 13th. I hope I haven't screwed that up, but I'm pretty sure it was. But it's yeah. amazing. I mean, oh, these yeah. guys, and you know you know what the culture's like from World War One. They wrote all the time, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, all, all that time in the trenches. So you yeah. have some amazing stuff. And the, the other thing, actually, from that era, which was amazing, and I stumbled across this years ago when I was working in the archives, it was a, quote, unknown diary. And it ran about 1,500 pages. Oh, and okay. it turned out it was a battle diary, and it was the battle diary of General Loomis. Oh, Frederick right. Loomis, yeah, who right. was the 13th yeah. Battalion, uh, yeah. th excuse me, 13th Battalion commander at the Second Eat, the first gas attack. Mm -hmm. And by from what I can understand, he didn't do the best of jobs there, but he mm -hmm. ended up getting promoted, and mm -hmm. he took over brigade. I think it was Second Brigade, if I'm not mistaken, and then was it Fourth? Division by the end of the war? Yes. Or third division. Yeah, third or fourth. Third. Anyway, he ended up in Mons. Third, I think. Yeah. yeah. So as a result, I mean, it's an incredible, you know, 1,500 pages. And it goes into the battles. It goes into his philosophy of command. It, uh, you know, sometimes, you know, he's even waxing poetic about the place of women in society, which you know, is quite interesting for the time. As you can imagine, <laughs> um, but it's it just gives you an example of you know the level of literacy amongst the the officers, and the fact that they you know they had the time and they were like I said well healed enough where this was something that was considered to be um, you know uh, culturally appropriate for them to do, and right. it's left an incredible legacy, you know for World War One for sure. Oh yeah, I mean the the things that we tend to think about, I think. 
for Canada's first world war anyway, a lot of it, a lot of the imagery, a lot of the, the literal writing, like you said, comes from black watch battalions, which is so interesting. I mean, I, yeah. I, I will bird's probably the one I've read, know the most about just because yeah, he's will bird. <laughs> well, of course, yeah. <laughs> it's hard to avoid him. He, well, he, the other the other thing I noticed, and it was when I was doing War Junk, um, we were fortunate enough to go under Boma Hamel and go under Vimy and go right, under, right. into areas where you don't usually get in Vimy. Right. And wherever we went underground, there was quite the Black Watch legacy. Like, they were not shy, no. you know? And I, I, I've argued that. I mean, you know, the Black Watch came out of the trenches with a reputation, and boy, did they know it, you know? <laughs> and that was something that, for better or for worse, became part of that Black Watch mystique. Mm -hmm. that was developed during that time but it's amazing to be under you know here you are under vimy ridge and you're you know four five six seven eight nine stories down and somebody has carved you know a beautiful 42nd battalion you know a uh, badge into the wall into the into the stone and it's absolutely incredible to think about it and you see it quite a bit and there's a lot of people who tend to leave their you know uh, some of them will just leave their service numbers but yeah. it seems to be the guys with the black watch will always make sure that it's 13th, you know, yeah. 42nd or 73rd. You know what I mean? There's, yeah, well, I definitely know what you mean. Yeah. There's a brand association. Yeah, exactly. It's today. a brand. You got to make yeah. sure you're, you're yeah. wrapping that brand because you're you're part of it. And, but part of the brand becomes part of you, I think, is not too crazy to say because. I, you get I, black watch I, blood. And yeah. Jimmy Wilkinson, one of my black watch snipers used to say, yeah. you know. Yeah. And he grew up in that. His father was, and that was the thing too. There's also a legacy, right? A family legacy. Yep. Um, and, and by the way, we should probably cl clarify because I do get a lot, especially in this day and age with social media and the internet and everything else, I do get a lot of um, uh, um, either requests or queries about the Imperial Black Watch. <laughs> and I just want to make sure that you remember that there are three, as far as I know, and there may be one more, but there are three Black Watch regiments in this world. There's the Imperial, which is in Scotland. And then there's the Canadian one, which eventually took its name and sort of allied itself, if you will. Yeah. Now, mind you, the Imperials kind of looked at us back in, you know, 100 years ago and went, yeah. who the hell are you upstarts? Yeah. And then after World War One, they went, yeah, OK, you can use the thing, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and but there's also one in Australia. And a lot of people right. don't realize that there's an Australian sure. Black Watch as well. And I think if I'm not mistaken, I know the regiment now is allied with the Transvaal Scots in South Africa. Okay. Who have just changed their name into something more traditional and appropriate. Um, but I don't think they were ever Black Watch at any time. Mm. But I just wanted to clarify that because a lot of times I'll get something from, you know, a, a query about, a you know, somebody who uh, who fought with the, you know, 7th Battalion, you know, of the Imperials. Yeah. And I have to explain that, look, uh, yeah. you know, Black Watch of Canada is distinct, you know, Separate. from that. So, yeah. yeah. Well, I was going to say this till later, but I think it's a good time to ask now. Sure from norma norma graham about the relationship because you I, I mean i know a little bit about it as well right because again i how do i say this a little bit of story is i don't work on the black watch at all i haven't done anything but i still found things about the black watch and the relationships that they have and the things that they did and this this came up a little bit because i was trying to find something else and as, yeah. as people know things are in boxes with other things that make no sense. And it was talking about the relationships and the, you know, the aligning with the different regiments. And to me, it's always just been an interesting thing yeah. that happens, right? It was meant to be almost practical in a sense. Uh, to yeah. learn. Well, but, see, this is the interesting thing. I mean, <laughs> it's nowhere near as close as a lot of people would think. I mean, we do yeah, share yeah. the name um, and there have been attempts to try to saddle the imperial history with the Canadian version. Yeah. I don't find, I mean, I'll probably get in trouble for saying this anyway with some of the people around the regiment, but there is no real connection whatsoever. No. Basically what you have are a bunch of Scots here in Montreal who create a unit. It goes through several different names. Finally, they go into World War I, I think is the fifth, fifth Highlanders, I think it is. I mean, there was so many different name changes. They all played off. Fifth Royal Scots. It changed I it so much. I can't remember now. But anyway, they finally came out with the Black Watch. Eventually, during the war, it started to take yeah. it. But as a result, there really is not an organic relationship between them. And I think part of it was 
you could agree on Black Watch for several reasons. One, they were the senior Highland Regiment, right. and we were the senior Highland Regiment in Canada. It made perfect sense. Also, too, if you take a look at the tartan, that is considered to be a government tartan, which is a neutral tartan. As mm -hmm. a matter of fact, you know, back in the 1600s, one of the reasons why they had it was to stop the fighting amongst the clans. So there was no clan domination here. This was a neutral thing. So it made perfect sense coming out of the kind of infighting that was going on amongst the Scots in the late 1800s over who was going to pay for the regiment, take care of the regiment, and this and that and the other thing, <laughs> that they just sort of gravitated towards that. Um, between the wars, nothing formal whatsoever. I mean, you, you would have family linkages, like sometimes, you know, first generation or second generation Scots who were here would have, you know, family there. And then there would be something informally struck up between them, but it wasn't, you know, kind of like the Imperials decided they were going to drop off a newborn in Canada at one point and then raise it from its own, you know, again, well, we, yeah. you know, we paid tribute to them. Yeah, I think that's a good way of putting putting it yeah. because, like I said, I again these things come up, and I did a little bit of work on exchanges yeah. as little as there was between the, yeah. the not even just the Commonwealth armies period, and there was talk of doing it, it just never went anywhere. Money, as always, yeah. is the reason given. Yeah, usually because it's just too expensive and too difficult. Um, but it's 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 an interesting that it was something they were in particular because I remember because I was. There was Black Watch. They were talking about doing this because of the name and yep. and this sort of yeah the idea of just Black Watch, which leads to another good question that uh, Alex Black has asked: where, where does Black Watch come from? Okay, that no one has ever really been able to nail that down. <laughs> um, basically, it is myth and fable. So the one that we tend to look at is the fact that either they stood watch at night over the Highlands. Or it was because of the adoption of the government tartan, which is rather dark. In other words, it's a, you know, it's a dark blue and it's a dark mm -hmm. green, right? So, but we've never really been able to nail it down. And there's plenty of myth over the years. So that's basically where it comes from, you know, the concept of the Black Watch. Now, now mind you, there are certain places, well, no, <laughs> there's certain people who just don't understand that. And sometimes if you say Black Watch, they look at you kind of funny. It's like, yeah. no, Royal Highland Regiment. It's a, you know, you have to explain what it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, because, you know, at one point you never had to explain it, but the brand recognition over the last little while has gone downhill for sure, you know? And it's just, it's part of the changing, you know, scope of the military and, and everything yeah. else, you know? Well, <laughs> oh, I may have hit the wrong one here. Hold on. Yeah. Sorry, Alex is making me laugh as he does uh, with his comments and these things. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah, of course. Right. Black Watch. Of course. Yes. That's I'm where sorry. He goes. I'm, I'm, Alex, I'm so sorry I've let you down. I, I of just, course, that's where he I goes. I completely yeah. failed as a historian. Yeah. yeah, that's just it's so funny. It's uh and then yeah, maybe it's a reference to the Scottish weather. <laughs> Douglas, that's good too. Could very well be. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Oh, and here's something I didn't another one. Again, the questions pour in, like I said, they do. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. All Protestant organization. Yes. As far as I know, it was. Yeah. All yeah. Presbyterian um, for sure. And uh, eventually that started to change and, mm -hmm. but few and far between uh, when they got to the second world war, things changed dramatically. And then of course, in this day and age, it's completely multicultural. I mean, it's, yeah. there's nothing, you know, nothing that would tie it back to the old ways of doing it. But in world war one, um, they had one, I think there was only one non-Protestant officer, maybe two, but one of them was Jewish. His name was Cohen. Right. But they used to, yeah, they used the way right. they did it. They called it Mac Cohen. They called him Mac Cohen just yeah. for fun. You know, it yeah, was just right. one of those things. But generally speaking, oh yeah, you're, you're talking about, you know, Presbyterian stock for the most part. Um, yeah. But again, that all changes by the Second World War. Yeah, these these old, yeah. How do I say it? Well, I, I, let me qualify that. That's with yeah. the officers because the men, yeah, the men were from the working class areas. Most yeah. of them were Irish. Yeah. You know, you had a lot of Irishmen. You know, mm -hmm. from the you know Griffin Town and Point St. Charles, Verdun, things like that. So yeah. technically, they would be Catholic, but yeah. you know, for the most part, it was kind of a muted you know, muted existence in that sense. You know, you yeah. were Black Watch, and that's all that mattered. Yeah, I was gonna say it's it's more about that. Because particularly, I was trying to say this is that I don't even know what the right word is here. That almost inner circle, that identity that the regiment had of this high class, you know, exclusive, Scott, 
exclusive, yeah, exclusivity. Old then, money, old club. But then for the ranks, yeah. it's that doesn't apply. Completely different. <laughs> oh, no, 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 completely different. Yeah. yeah, and after it, during the interwar period, they came under a lot of flack because you could imagine that there was a serious old boys net, right? A, oh, yeah. a Black Watch Mafia, yeah. and you know they always talk about the Gunner Mafia, and it was basically yeah. the Gunner Mafia going against the Black Watch Mafia yeah. because they were the old family regiments. And I've seen even in the beginning of the World War II some of the correspondence between the Colonel in Chief, or the, the I should say the Colonel here in Montreal. Uh, Paul Hutchison, when they were mm -hmm. trying to disband regiments at the beginning of the war, yeah, right. they wanted to go for a Canadian Corps of Infantry, just like they would have a Corps of Engineers and, you know, artillery. Um, and he was fighting tooth and nail. And the accusations were, look, you're, you're an outdated dinosaur. You know, you're old family, old money regiments. This doesn't work in this day and age. Right. And part of that argument you'd have to say in some ways it you know, does hold up and you understand that when it comes to the overall framework of the army and where things are moving. Right. But at the same time, the counter argument that Hutchison brought up, he said, buddy, you've never been in the front lines. And he said, there is, there is something essential about that unit identity, mm -hmm. whether it be black watch or other units that is absolutely essential for infantiers. It yeah. is truly that team spirit that keeps them together on that, smaller uh, lower level um so in this right. particular sense i think they you know by the end of world war ii they're still a, a hybrid and even today yeah. you know there's a hybrid i mean you know it's yeah. it's it's fun to walk around and yeah black watch and we have our traditions but at the same time those traditions are two percent of what the full 100 percent spectrum is as part yeah. of the Canadian armed forces whereas you could probably argue it might have been 40 50 percent back at you know in the interwar period Mm -hmm. where the Black Watch did things the Black Watch way, and then it was up to the Army to catch up. You know? It doesn't work like that now. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> but you know? yeah, well, there's other issues. But uh, what I was going to say is I think this is an interesting way of looking at it, too, for, for non-British Commonwealth, right? Because different armies have different, that core unit. Like, I've seen this online. Yeah. Someone on Twitter was talking about um, a company, right? Like, in... Yeah. In particularly in the United States in the Civil War, a company was everything. Like that's all that yeah. mattered. Yeah. And then comes to the, you know, even just the British Commonwealth experience of the First World War. It's like company, who cares? Like it's all about the regiment. Company means regiment. nothing. So yeah. I think it's just it's interesting that because the regiment is the building block. Yeah, but remember too, you know, when you're talking about a core setting in the United States, you're not talking about neighborhoods. The regiments True. are based on a geographical area, right? Yeah. So there there is a, a, a tie back home. Um, to where you live. I mean, this is, you know, the the strengths and weaknesses. And of course, right. anytime you're discussing regiment and whatever else, there, it's a double-edged sword. There's always, always yeah, there's yeah. always things like this. So, but again, it comes down to that small unit action, the, yeah. the bonding between men. What will, or in this case, soldiers now in this day and age, but back then men, um, what will, what can you provide them that will galvanize them when the worst is about to happen. Hmm. You know, what will they fight for? What will they sadly, in some cases, die for, or at least be determined to do their job, regardless of what it is, to lull their last breath. Yeah. And they could, you still can't get away from regiment, you know, as, as that kind of bonding, that identity for bonding. Well, it, it's it, it, amazing. Yeah, it makes a, it's a good, well, that's what I mean when I think when I'm saying building block, yes, technically, I mean, in the organizational sense, yes, it still is, obviously. I mean, there was issues that, you know, the unification, which I don't want to talk about. Well, <laughs> well that, so that hits the Black Watch hard. You know, <laughs> later on, I mean, if we get to that, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I would argue the brand recognition of Black Watch is nowhere near what it used to be. Well, because, that happens for yeah, so many, everything. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, you could argue the Queen's Own. You could argue, you know, anybody who sort of went the way of the, you know, the the pen um, when they got cut back in the late sixties, early seventies. That certainly yeah. happens. But to get back to your to yeah. the point you were making, like at the beginning of World War II, when the war broke out, the Canadian Army was kind of slow off the mark when it came mm -hmm. to training and selection and building up pools of reserves. So the Black Watch continued to operate the way they had in World War I, which was yeah. essentially they were going to be responsible for their recruiting. They were going to be responsible for their own training and stocking the shelves so Black Watch reserves or Black Watch reinforcements could reinforce the Black Watch unit. 
Yep. And they created something what was called what was called the Provisional Officers Training School for officers, young mm. officers called POTS. Yep. And to be honest with you, it was really amazing because what they did is they went out and they, they got all their World War I veterans and they brought them back in. But they were smart enough to realize that the nature of warfare, particularly infantry warfare to a degree, was changing, right. but that there were certain elements that would never change. The basic principles of being an infantry in the front line basically are, are still the same even today. So they were harnessing that, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the corporate knowledge, if you will, you know, yeah. and bringing it forward. But the Canadian Army stepped in and said, yeah, no, you shut this down. <laughs> you know, we're going to have proper training centers and everybody's going to go into the pool and then, you know, whoever needs it, needs it. And if they happen to be of a particular regiment and everything works well and we can feed them to you, then we'll feed them to you. But you're, it's not going to be proprietary like it was in World War One. Well, I was going to say that's that's the lesson of World War One, and mm. that's the lesson again. I get angry about him all the time, but the Sam Hughes school, I guess you could call it, of this do your own thing kind of thing, which doesn't work when you're trying to. No, the idiosyncratic approach. Yeah, and yeah, I think it doesn't work. this was the big this was the big thing that the Black Watch were facing. Yeah. Um, particularly in World War II, going into World War II, were accusations of this. And yeah. fair enough, because mm -hmm. they were trying to operate as their own, you know, without yeah. a doubt. And it's because they were used to it. They had yeah. got away with it. They were the masters of their own domain, and no one ever said no to them. Until mm -hmm. no. <laughs> you know? Well, they're, they're, I think that's it there, is because no one ever said no, and then yeah. someone did. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And people were not happy about it. But, oh, but no. if, it works out in the long run, I think, better for just all kinds of reasons. Uh, but maybe we can talk about that. But to me, it just it seems to be it was one of those things where they, the Canadian government, despite all its faults at the beginning of the war, that is the one lesson that was learned. It's like, OK, we got to the old system didn't work. It, it led to too many problems. We have to centralize. Right. We have to yeah. learn that, yeah. that was the message. That was what was learned in the First World War. And like these things do, they get forgotten. And it was yeah brought back. And, well, you, know, you can see that in the, with the infantry. I mean, the art of the infantry is essentially the same across the board. The difference yeah. would be the seasoning when yes. it comes to regimental pride, regimental expectations. And you can argue that some of them are over the top. And yeah. by World War II, and you and I have discussed this in the context of Varia Ridge and the fact that the Black Watch go up you know, the ridge in broad daylight, you know, uh, under fire from three sides. And basically the decision you know, came down to them not wanting to be dishonored. They didn't want to let the family down. They didn't want to let the regiment down. So yeah. there is always a tipping point, right? There's a yeah, fine line yeah. between <laughs> regimental pride and, and you know, stupidity, I suppose, yeah. in some cases. Yeah, I guess that's the best. We were, because we were talking about that before, what to even call that. <laughs> it's this. Yeah, I'm not sure if stupidity is right, but, you know, or slavish, slavish adherence to, you know, tradition and honor. Tradition, yeah, tradition. And, yeah. yeah, that's probably a good way to put it. I don't know, foolhardy. I don't know what seems yeah. to come to mind. Yeah, I mean, it's a very interesting discussion because I remember, I think it was in Valor and the Horror when they inter interviewed Jacques Dextras about yeah. the Black Watch. Yeah. And he said, yeah, he said, you just have to come to a point where you say this ain't on and you have to have the moral courage to do something like that. Now, that's easy, easier to say in hindsight um, being on the field at the time with the kind of heavy, and I, I argue this in the book, um, the Black Watch legacy is a wonderful thing, but it's also an albatross. Mm -hmm. It's an albatross hanging around the necks of those officers who now have to take the torch in World War II. They're fighting a newer type of war, a different war, a more three-dimensional style of war than the, yeah. the linear kind of fighting. Yet the expectations at home from the fathers and the older brothers and right. the, you know, and the uncles are that you are going to fight this exactly like World War I, mm -hmm. um, not realizing, of course, what they're up against. And, right. you know, things are changing. You know, the whole even, even how we value human life has changed yeah. dramatically in those 20 years. Mm -hmm. You know, so, and, and you can see that particularly on July 25th, where you have, you know, the Black Watch goes up, gets massacred. You've got the um, uh, uh, Royal Hamilton Light Infantry who put on an incredible performance at Varia Ridge. I mean, I would argue it's state of the art for that particular day. They put on an incredible one. Yep. But you also have mutiny at the other end where yeah. you have the yeah. seasoned, you know, the veteran third division 
one of their brigadiers and two of their battalion commanders refused to carry out Simmons' orders to go up the ridge. Mm -hmm. One of them is actually Black Watch, which is interesting. Charles Penn. Yeah, but he's not. Black, Black Watch, which was fascinating. On the day. Um, yeah. yeah, but they don't do it. So you can see that, you know, perhaps if the Black Watch had been in action a little bit longer than just those mm. seven days. Yeah. Maybe they would have had, uh, you know, a bit more confidence or, uh, you know, to say no. Yeah, and, and we talked about that. I think we talked about that quite extensively last time about yeah what those seven days mean. And yeah. I mean, you've got that weight of history, like as we we're talking about, and then it's seven days. <laughs> then I know yeah. everything goes more or less to hell, and all kinds of factors of why that is the case. But mm -hmm. but it is yeah, it's it's an interesting thing to think. But about. the fascinating part, and I'm not sure if we got into it on that show, but there is a transformation within the regiment after that. Because right. even though I'd say about 30% of the, the men who were at Verrier were not from Montreal, some of them were Americans, you know, yep. Saskatchewan, the rest of Canada, Eastern Europe, or whatever else. By the time they start rebuilding, they are now taking men in from right across the country. Yep. So that exclusiveness, that territorial exclusiveness of the Black Watch being a Montreal regiment, it changed forever. Yep. Because now you have thousands of men coming in over the next 10 months who then become Black Watch, and you know, it's, once you're in, you're never out. Well, that well, yeah. <laughs> well, that's you know, yeah, maybe we can talk about that at the end or something. Yeah, sure. A whole other, yeah, but it's just it's interesting because that I mean, this is about the Black Watch today, obviously, but you see yeah. that in other regiments as well. And I get because mm -hmm. I get asked this right, and because people will watch shows, and it'll be like, you know, it'll be Joe Smith, and it'll say, you know, from Toronto, but then he's with the South Sass, and then people get confused. Yeah, <laughs> so exactly. like, why is he in that unit? I'm like, because that's. It's complicated, but that's not how it actually works. It's not like you live yeah. in Moose Jaw and you're going to a Saskatoon, you know, or yeah. a Saskatchewan regiment or something. That's yeah. not how it went. No, that would be a bit more uh, predominant in, in big city regiments at the beginning of the war, just simply because you had so many yeah. men showing up, right? They're not going to yeah. run out to the country and sign up. They're going to come into whatever the, you know, the local regiment is. So, and just the, you yeah. know. Yeah, the amount. It's just of another interesting level, I think, to keep in mind. Uh, yeah, when understanding all of this. Yeah, yeah and yeah, just said to your Colin watching, who's up again late watching one of our shows. <laughs> true of all the regiments throughout the. It's true. Uh, yeah, that's again. That's why the regiment is, and I'm not saying the Black Watch. I'm saying the regiment concept is so important to understand because mm -hmm. I've heard it applied. First World War, Second World War, even in Korea, I heard the example, sorry, this is a bit off track and rabbit hole, so I'll make everyone happy. I just said it out loud, <laughs> is I've heard it was applied in Korea because when when there was POWs, because there was legitimate, you know, the North Koreans and the Chinese were literally trying to brainwash POWs. Like they were literally yeah. trying to do that. That's not just science, like from some movie. Anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We literally know that happened. But my supervisor made the point that it that helped men from breaking is because they had this regimental yeah. sort of identity and they, but they all stuck together, which I think yeah. is so interesting. Cause he, he, he talked about in comparison to American units, which had it a little different, right. Cause they're broken up in different ways. So I think it's just why well, I also another reason when you said, yeah, the black watch, I'm like, all right, we can talk about the regimental element. Yeah. Cause I just don't think that gets discussed yeah. fairly enough in my opinion, but yeah, yeah sorry, there's there's an back. incredible sense of pride that, like yeah. I said, will will get you through some of the darkest moments and it sounds strange, but it, it'll work in many things. I mean, you know, I've had things that have been tough in my life and, you know, it, it, it's not so much, I think, black watch every day, but at the same time, I, right. you know, I think about the experiences of my grandfather and his brothers in the trenches in World War One, and my father and my uncle in the North Atlantic in World War Two, And I, yeah. you know, and somebody asked me, you know, when I, when I did one day in August, I, I sat down and I wrote for 242 straight days without a break. And they went, oh my God, that must've been tough. And I'm like, yeah, no, I was at home. <laughs> you know, I was I was eating like crazy, gaining sixty pounds and drinking wine while I was writing. No, 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 no. It was uh, yeah, that was hell on earth for me. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. But it gets you through. You know, it gets you through yeah. some of those dark moments, so you can understand when things are really horrible. You know. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I just want to go back because I yeah because yeah. Alex, who knows. Juno Beach Center knows quite a bit about Normandy, <laughs> I would say. It's saying it, say he agrees with you, right? If, yeah. if it wasn't at the end of that first week. And oh, I agree. And also, I think there's also, you know, a lot of momentum that is built up. I mean, yeah. these poor yes. guys are exhausted. Yeah. I mean, it's seven days without sleep, without yeah. proper food, without, you know, high tension, you know? Yeah. They're, they're sitting there, you know, for four days exposed on Hill 61. And yeah. you never go there. 
you know, like I'm sure Colin will be, you know, jumping around Hill 61. He was there last year or last year, a year and a half ago when we did something for Woody at World War II television. Right, right, right. Um, you know, you're sitting there under sniper fire, fending off, you know, probes, panzer-led counterattacks, uh, you know, artillery, mortars, rockets, everything is, you know, coming down. And then, of course, you know, they, they decide to cut your rum ration off. Yeah. Just when you need something to steady your nerves. Yeah. And, and, and reg, regiment will only take you so far. Rum will take you a bit further. Well, yeah, you know? can't deny that one. Because it's yeah, you know, so everyone talks about it, but yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, but yeah, I know like Alex and I definitely are on the same page with that. I yeah. think if had they been a bit more seasoned and if it wasn't for that momentum that they yeah. were on, that runaway train momentum, I think, yeah, they probably... yeah, it's the boulder down the hill, I think, is a good way of putting it because it could have been stopped, right? Because some did, like you already said, some sure. like, we're not, what the hell, we're not doing that. <laughs> yeah. Well, to be honest with you, what and I, I made this argument, and I think we, you and I talked about it. Once you poke the bear, the job yeah. is done. And by the time daylight comes up on Verrier, the bear's been poked. Oh, yeah. and the bear's coming. Yeah. So the idea would have been you should have dug in, in either back on Hill 61 yeah. and have absorbed it, or in the Twin Towns. But, you know, going up Verrier in broad daylight, yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah, but then again, that's again like I always say, context matters. That's why yep. we're talking about it because, yep. and again, we're not trying to armchair general here. That's not what we're trying to do. We're just trying to understand it, and and that's why we're doing this because we're trying to understand why things are the way they are. And sorry, and Scott, he makes a good point. Yes, I'm not. I wasn't saying that U.S. units don't have the same sort of level of pride and spirit. No, not at all. That's not what I was saying. I'm just saying, and yeah. in, that, in that Korean context, that regimental block for those particular POWs seem to be the like you said, it's that thing that sometimes can yeah. push you. It's just, but the thing is, yeah, but it seems to be natural. I mean, yeah, you know, even if you're in an American unit, yeah, you will no, identify right. in some ways with, like, say you're the 82nd or you're the 506th or you're, you know, the 101st, they're your right. easy company. You're going to find that yeah. niche. It depends on where it is. For for well, Canadians well, and for the Brits, it's at the regimental level. Well, sorry, that was my point is, is because, yeah. if, just again, because he was, I can't remember, this was years ago and he, he had backed it up. He was talking to me about it, but he had sources and we were talking about different historians and everything. He's just saying in that particular in circumstance, I think it was just that camp. They just kept all those guys, those regiments, those Canadians together from the same regiment. That was all. Yeah. So they had like their, you know, their, the, the CSM was with them. So that is yeah, something exactly. like, you're like, come on, yeah, boys, yeah. we're the regiment here. I'm not saying that they're not having that uh, uh, sort of spree de corps. That's not what I'm saying. It's just, again, I'm trying to understand the Canadian stories I often do and trying to mm. bring that up. And I just, again, you can't forget the regimental, uh, the building block. But yeah, and then, and then they're talking, and there's just more chat about that in the sidebar about U.S. identifying and who they identify with. But anyway, I do want to keep moving because yeah, I mean the only the only one I would say yeah. from the American right. experience is a little bit different would be the Marine Corps, because mm. the Marine Corps for a, you're a Marine, you're a Marine, period, mm -hmm. and that's mm -hmm. got a, that's very yeah. interesting, right? Yeah, that's a very, very interesting. interesting set of loyalty where you you don't hear yeah I'm from you know first division of the Marines. Yeah. No, 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 you're Marine regiment. Marine. None of that matters. I yeah, mean, yeah, very interesting. Even no matter what your role is, it's... Uh, yep, it's, that's right. But again, maybe that's because of the brutality of the specific. I don't know. Anyway, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. But uh, that's what I was just trying to say. It's it's a building block in Canada. It's how things are understood. It's the lens, I guess, is the best way yeah. to say it. It's the lens how things are understood. And the Black Watch is a good lens to use because it's... Uh, well, they're everywhere. <laughs> and they have a storied history with some mistakes. Do I do want to move on. If that's for better or for worse. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because we, we we talked about Normandy and kind of the little bit of the uh, the aftermath uh, of uh, Operation Spring. How how does the how does you know how does the battalion that's overseas bounce back? Is it just because reinforcements were elsewhere? Uh, anything else going on there? Is there it was they still had a bit of a if you will a slush fund of reinforcements um, that they could tap into, and they rebuilt around the first of August, and they mm. were just sort of cobbling themselves together when there was a, an urgent request that came in or an urgent order that came down. Um, at this particular point, and some of you, I've, I've written about this, and it's been in, um, I think it was the Canadian, mili uh, not Canadian military history, but the Canadian Army Journal yeah. um, several years ago. Right. And um, I wrote about this where basically they were asked to stick their necks out. Um, Ultra, believe it or not, Ultra had revealed the right. origins of the Mortain counterattack and nobody yeah. really put, put it together. But the information came down that the first SS were pulling out yeah. from in front of the Canadians and moving back. They didn't know where they were going, but they knew they were moving back. 
And part of the regulations for Ultra was that you couldn't take action based on it unless it was corroborated in the, you know, basically you gave an excuse to the enemy. Right. So part of that had to do with sending out patrols. And mm -hmm. sometimes, for instance, like the attack on August 1st at Tilly was essentially inspired by that as well. Yeah. And so now August 5th, they have to go out again. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, um, not everybody, as you can imagine, knew the nuanced or had a nuanced understanding of ultra. I right. mean, basically, you're talking about army level and, yeah. you know, not even core mm -hmm. level. Simmons did because Simmons was a different character. I was going to say Simmons was Simmons. Simmons was a Simmons was Simmons. <laughs> and no, no, no. But it was it. Okay. It to, yeah. Part of no, it, I know part it had to do with the way I know. Creer was viewed. Creer was not viewed as a battlefield commander. He was no. more of a diplomat, more of an organizer. And Montgomery didn't have any faith in his martial ability, but he had all faith in Simmons. Exactly. So as a result, Simmons was kind of given, you know, unofficial reading rights at first. Um, also, too, Harry Creer was ill. Um, he had a chronic issue. Yeah. yeah. And he had named Simmons as his successor should anything happen to him. And therefore, they felt it was appropriate that Simmons be let in on Ultra. Yeah. Um, so anyway, the point is it stopped there and it yes. couldn't get down to division, couldn't get down to no. brigade. No. So all the division commander and the brigade commander knew was, look, this is urgent. We have to go out and establish is the first SS there. I mean, we have intelligence, not telling them where intelligence that says they're moving. And sure enough, the black watch go out and what ultra didn't reveal was that this was a partial or or uh, a partial withdrawal in other yep. words they were going but they hadn't gone as of yet they were in the process of moving and of course you don't just up and move twenty thousand men and go no. you do it you know in a protracted way so piecemeal way one piece goes one piece one piece yes. one piece so the black watch end up slamming in to the rear guards of the first ss and they take a toll and they lose an entire company literally of guys who have just arrived and a few of the survivors and one of the big heroes of uh, Verrier Ridge, uh, Ronnie Bennett, who mm. is prime minister uh, RB Bennett's nephew right. is killed during this action. Now he's not killed with the company up above, but he's killed by German shell fire that comes down on the black watch headquarters. So that was tough because he was about the only um, surviving officer, uh, right. which is interesting. He was the only one that survived, uh, except for Frank Mitchell, who was left out of battle for Verrier. He was the yeah. 2IC. He came forward to pick up the pieces. So literally within 10 yeah. days, they are wiped out, or at least they lose another company. And what was a concern about this was traditionally, if you lost 10%, it would take a month to retrain. If you lost 20% right. in ideal conditions, right? 20% yeah. would be two months, 30 the Black Watch lost 94%, okay, 94%, and they were given 10 days to rebuild, <laughs> 10 days. And then, of course, they go out and they lose another 120 men going up the road. Now, this also has a ripple effect because you can imagine that they already had little to no confidence in the Brigadier, in Brigadier William <laughs> McGill, yep. and this just shattered any remaining you know, uh, uh, faith in his abilities. Right. And of course, you know, he was just being quote, a, you know, a good a soldier yeah. by following orders himself. Yep. And, but you know, he had no clue why they were doing this. He didn't know where it was coming from. He didn't know the veracity of the intelligence. It was like, look, we've been ordered and you're going to go do it. Mm -hmm. And that was the, I guess some people would say the strengths and weakness of Brigadier McGill as a brigadier was that mm -hmm. he was a, he was a whip cracker. Yeah. He was, he was a, but the black watch had no respect. They, for him, they no. thought he was a funnel, simply just a funnel. No. So now because of all this, because of very air and because of this battle that happens on August 5th at Mesa Orn, which is just up the road. Now there is absolutely no faith left in Brigadier McGill whatsoever to the point where all the black watch COs from now on uh, up until probably within a month of the end of the war um, are constantly going out of touch with McGill on the radio. Right. You know, in other words, yes, sir. Yeah. What are the orders? Uh-huh. Thank you, sir. Okay. <laughs> Forget what he said. Let's do it. Our <laughs> way. And this is, this is interesting. And it actually ends up 
costing the new Black Watch commander, uh, Frank Mitchell, his job on the right. Albert Canal, which yeah. is fascinating. You know? I want to get there. Let yeah. Okay. There. You want to get there. Okay. <laughs> no. Well, there's a few things. It's just because it's 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 funny because you said ultra. So. <laughs> Yeah, it took me 40 Almost minutes. Counting. And I haven't Almost said counting. DF yet. I haven't said DF. So I'm sure that's coming. Not in conversation. Uh, <laughs> but you have. Uh, anyway, no. So, yeah, I do want to get there because I want to talk about that's the, the the next one I want to get to because I I understand, yeah. you know, like logistically how the, you know, the battalions rebuilt and all of that and everything. Yeah. And, and just, but then you have it happen again, right? It's, it's black. Friday, Black Thursday. I can't remember. Oh, that comes up. Yeah, that comes up. It's Black Black Friday, Black Friday, Friday, October thirteenth in the Shelt. I gotta ask about that because, well, yeah. Lauren, she's a big big Shell proponent of talking about the Shell because, yeah. but it has parallels, right? Yeah. So well, it does. I mean, that, the Black yeah. Watch. You have to understand that, and I mentioned this in one of my other talks that I was doing recently, where um, uh, the because of the severity of the reinfor of the casualties that the black watch take they are literally on point for the reinforcement crisis in other words they're the ones who are out front because they're the ones who need the most reinforcements yep. but the canadian army for whatever reason um their wastage tables horrible term but their wastage tables expected to take more casualties in the armored corps they didn't yep. think the infantry would be hit as hard so suddenly now they did not they did not have infantry trained reinforcements to send to infantry units. So now the Black Watch becomes sort of the poster boy for the reinforcement crisis. Right. And particularly after they lose again at another 120 men at Mace or Orn in August, yeah. now they're getting literally the, the, the baker, the candlestick maker, the shoemaker, everybody else being refit and sent to the front lines. But even on August 5th, okay, get this, even on August 5th, um, Frank Mitchell, the CEO, is worried about the reinforcements. And he, oh. he writes home and he said, you're not going to believe this. He said, I had a kid who was killed on the 5th of August who wasn't in the army on D-Day. Yeah. So, you know, he was sitting at the, I, I think I'll, I'll never forget this, the Lowe's Theater in Montreal, which used to be big when I was a kid, the Lowe's Theater. And he saw the, you know, the newsreels of D-Day and decided he'd join the army. And I have him in the front line with less than six weeks total service right. in the military. Right. So you know that there was something really wrong right from that start. And then, so it really starts in August, right after Verrier. And Verrier is really the catalyst for all this, the, the mm -hmm. incredible casualties that we take, not just in, on the 25th, but on the 18th and, and afterwards. Yep. And so now the Black Watch are struggling. Because they're being reduced in effective strength when you think about it. Um, the men who are fighting through places like Spiker and then they're coming through St. Leonard and whatever else and working their way up into the Scheldt, yeah. these poor guys don't get a break. No. You know, they're veterans and they're, you know, taking in guys who barely can tie their laces, let alone figure out how to, you know, reload a weapon. And they are forced to either teach them on the job, learn on the job, or sadly, in some cases, suffer from that. It, uh, incompetent, yeah. you know, which is really a crime because the army had the, you know, the, the responsibility for properly trained reinforcements and they dropped the ball dramatically. But then again, the nature of the fighting never gave the Canadian units a chance to pause right. to really retrain and restock, you know, because everything was moving so fast. They were swanning up the left, you know, the long left flank. Yeah. So, you know, you can imagine yourself if you're a young platoon commander and suddenly you're, you know, first of all, you're reduced. You don't have this typical 36. You're probably down to about 24, 25 guys. Yeah. And out of them, you'd be lucky if two thirds of them were trained properly. Yeah, right. You know, and so by the time we reach um, um, uh, October 13th, we're kind of coming to a head with all this. You know, the Black Watch are still taking casualties. They're still getting poorly trained reinforcements. Um, and then by the time they get there, they're given a, a god awful job, like a World War I style, <laughs> you know, attack over flat polder land for almost a kilometer to basically attack a, attack a couple of dikes that are at the end that are manned by the Fallschirmjäger, the German paratroopers, which were at that time as elite as you could probably get. Mm. They knew their job. 
they had limited artillery, uh, no air support at mm -hmm. the moment. Um, some of that, the argument has been made that that was completely underestimated by McGill. Um, mm. And by this time, you know, the Black Watch were kind of fed up, you know, working with him. Um, they had already lost their CO, um, yeah. their second CO, Frank Mitchell, who got himself fired um, <laughs> a few weeks before, um, essentially because they got to the Albert Canal and, um, and McGill had come up with this idea saying, look, there are no Germans on the other side. Just bounce yeah. it and go. Yeah. And they just looked at him and went, yeah, we've heard this one, one too many times. <laughs> so what they did was they said, yeah, no problem, sir. And then they went off and basically they were just going to tank it. And mm -hmm. so uh, George Bush, who was one of their uh, B-U-C-H, um, yes. one of their uh, platoon command or company commanders at the time, he was a right. platoon commander at Verrier. He was the yep. Verrier veteran. He was the only survivor, as a matter yeah. of fact, the officer corps who was back in. Um, he basically, they came up with an idea that they were going to tie, or Mitchell told them, uh, basically make as much noise. Yeah. Let the Germans know you're there, have right. them open up, you go to ground, and this whole thing is off. And we save everybody's life. Yeah. Well, they tried doing that. They made a ruckus. Somebody screwed up something. They got caught halfway across the canal. Yeah. All hell broke loose. McGill came down, realized what was up, and fired Mitchell on the spot. And then replaced him. He wanted uh, Torchy Slater, who was his brigade major. And then Torchy disappeared wow. in the middle of combat. He disappeared. Um, so Bruce Ritchie became the mm. Black Watch CO. And unfortunately, even though he was Black Watch, mm -hmm. he was um, he was not well liked within the Black Watch. He was um, he had about as as much personality as an accountant. Sorry to the accountants out there, but you know what I mean. <laughs> Stereotypical accountant. Let's just say that. He Very just, wooden. Yeah. Yeah. He was extremely wooden. You know, he wouldn't get much out of you, but he was competent, yes. you know, but he did not get along. Nobody got along with McGill. McGill was not interested in the Black Watch. It was a horrible situation. Mm -hmm. So on that particular morning, there was already criticism, not only of high command, but also, believe it or not, and this is fascinating. The, um, the files of the Canadian field ambulance um, the 18th Field Ambulance are already criticizing. It's not just the 18th Field. It, it's another one as well. But the, it's Major Letourneau, who is a doctor, who is heavily criticizing Bruce Ritchie for taking the only structure in the area to use as his headquarters as opposed to a first aid station. So actually, what, where his criticism is, is when the attack goes in, there's obviously going to be casualties. Yep. So instead of having the casualties come back to a first aid station, which is less than a kilometer from where they were hit, right. they now have to drive five to six kilometers in an open top carrier or Jeep, risking hypothermia in essentially late fall, you know, or, or mid fall. And he actually writes at the end, he said a lot of them died on their way in. In other words, they could have easily have been saved on that particular day. But anyway... Yeah. The Black Watch kickoff. Um, a lot of they were missed their timings for their artillery simply because nobody understood the ground. Yeah. And trying to advance through Polder is very slow. It's not a hard open field, and apparently nobody could do those calculations mm -hmm. for whatever reason. And so, as a result, the the um, first two um, the first two companies that were making the assault were absolutely decimated. They were pinned down. And then later in the day, they brought in flamethrowing carriers and a few other things, wasps to support them, brought in more artillery and a little bit of air power, but it didn't really get them anywhere. Yeah. So basically, they took two big kicks at the can going across no man's land um, and were, again, you know, almost wiped out to to a man going across in some cases. They took heavy casualties. 55 were killed, which is just under half of what they lost at Verrier. Mm. Um, and there was over 100 casualties in total. And so, you know, within the space of, you know, July, August, September, October, in four months, the Black Watch has been wiped out 94% in one. They lose about 35% in another and about 50% in this. Yeah. So, you know, it's it's insane, the amount of casualties. Yeah. And, a, sorry, go ahead. But there's something else that happens, and this is something I'm working on, too, kind of, it's for the sequel. By the way, there eventually will be a sequel to Seven Days, okay? So there you go. There we go. Uh, after my other book comes out on the on an air crew, oh, right, I'll right, be right. back to this one. Yeah. Um, but there, was, there were eight men who were court-martialed from the Black Watch on mm. the 13th of, uh, 13th of October. Okay. Um, 
eight of them, six of them had just arrived. And basically they had either broken down in battle or refused to carry out orders. And mm -hmm. there was really no mercy for them. And, but the interesting part were two others, two others were veterans. One of them survived very air. So he mm -hmm. survived very air. He survived Macer Orn, fought all the way up and then finally broke down and they threw the book at them, all eight of them. In mm -hmm. World War I, they would have been executed, but of course, mm -hmm. things had changed dramatically, culturally. And so they were all found guilty um, very quickly in court martials in the field, or field court martials, I should say. And they were sentenced to eight years hard labor. Jeez. Eight years hard labor. Thank now, you. that was commuted by Harry Creer to a year, but they all did a year. They did? Oh, and, okay. That's rare. Yeah, and it's really quite something. But that it is was. Rare. But it's fascinating looking at them because although there was sympathy to a degree, mm. um, there was no sympathy for the guys who just arrived. You know, right. there was absolutely no sympathy from the from the rest of them. In other words, we've been here. This is what you're supposed to do. You listen in battle and that's all there is to it. Right. There was a little bit more sympathy, at least amongst the Black Watch, for the two guys who had, if you will, paid their dues. Right, right. You know, up until that time, but yeah, it, it's a, it's a very dark chapter, you know, of yeah. of what is happening at that time. And again, it comes down to you know, and and I Terry Terry Cop and I probably look at this a different way, and I know which Terry Terry's interpretation is different from mine on this. Um, but uh, you know, these guys were so poorly trained going in that at one point, and get this, they didn't know, you know, one of the new reinforcements didn't know how to reload a Bren gun. Yeah. Now the Bren gun is used to Bren lay gun. down suppressing fire so you can close and kill with your enemy. Yep. Now the guys who have been trained for this and are veterans take that for granted. Yeah. And they expect that that fire is going to be continuous or relatively continuous. At least, they're going to, you know, yeah. unless, yeah. unless it jams or they run out of ammunition, they're not going to expect that the guy who is manning the Bren gun doesn't know where to put, you know, doesn't know mm -hmm. how to, you know, reload it. Yep. Yep. And it's not, and this is where Terry and I differ on this. Terry, Terry has always said that it was the, it wasn't the veterans that were taking the, 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 the punishment in this. It was, or mm -hmm. sorry, it wasn't the, the newbies. It was the veterans. Right. And so really the fact that they were untrained didn't matter. But when you look at small unit tactics, when you are relying on that guy to lay down fire, it's not the guy who can't reload his weapon, who's, you know, hanging back a little bit, laying down covering fire, that's going to get it. Yeah. It's the guys who are out in the middle of no man's land with the only thing that's keeping them alive is that covering fire. Mm -hmm. And it's those veterans who take it for granted now who are left out to hung out to dry. Mm -hmm. So that would be the, the flip side of the argument where, where Terry and I would have on something like this, you know? And it just happened to be that because it, it comes down to understanding that small unit tactic. Yes. Know? Yeah, well, that's the big part of a lot of, I think, Second World War, even scholarship, is that that is mm. misunderstood in a lot yeah, of ways. Very much. Or misapplied, I guess, because there's so much that comes from that. Again, I don't want to go down that. Yeah. yeah by, the, by the way, I should take a little, uh, just a bit of a note. In, in the archives, yeah. uh, in the Canadian archives, there is a fantastic collection uh, of battlefield questionnaires. Mm. There are hundreds of them. They yep. were done. They were done. Um, basically, it was a program that was put on not just by the Canadian Army, but by the British Army. Although I've never seen the British ones, I but the either. Canadian Army did it, where all officers who were wounded um, basically had a massive questionnaire to fill out. And historically, they're incredible. The stuff that they have in there, I found more stuff about the oh, Black yeah. Watch, you know, reports that you never would have seen in there. So if you are quite serious and looking at the sharp end. Yeah. You have to track down these battlefield questionnaires. Without yeah, them. it was, uh, I was going to say this, I was so jealous when I learned about those because I had just started my, my dissertation on Hong Kong and I'm like, oh, come on. Like, <laughs> just rub it in my face a little more how yeah. much, you know, post-Normandy or even post-Sicily there is. And I'm just like yeah. fighting scraps. I'm literally crossing an ocean to find scraps here. Oh, I know. Anyway, that's an aside, but uh, a quick question, actually, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, sure. I don't know if you can even answer this. Uh, Two-volume history, that's supposedly... Um, yes. Okay, I, I just found out they're looking at it for Christmas next year. Okay, hmm. so 2022. So it should be out late fall. Um, this is a magisterial work, without a doubt. It runs 1,500 pages, 
But I think what they've done is they've broken it down into three 500 page volumes. Okay. So volume Jesus. one will be coming out next Christmas. And I'm assuming, depending on how things go, Christmas after Christmas after, but it may be two years in between because oh. it's, it's one of those things for those of you who, who knew Roman, um, once Roman gets going, Roman got going. Roman Yeremowitz was uh, it wrote it. And uh, yeah, he assembled stuff throughout the entire 160-year history of the regiment. And then, of course, it went through its editorial process, yeah. which is always a difficult thing within a regiment, right? And, uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, I mean, think about doing a family history. Think about doing oh, a yeah. family history and see if you can get everybody to agree on what oh, goes yeah. in it, let alone the interpretation, right? Yeah. So difficult to say yeah. the least i mean yeah. it's, that's starting to change right because of um, depending on what the unit is and all that yeah. i mean i think about the first world war ones that came out in the centenary and how those were different yeah exactly yeah. i mean ideally ideally it would be nice if they were outside of the regiment whoever was right ideally yes outside, <laughs> nothing to do now roman roman is not black watch but he is a, a very good friend of the regiment or he yeah. was he, um, he died a few years back, but uh, yeah, he was very, very close, uh, yeah. you know, without a doubt. But sure. uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Um, you know, I've seen the Second World War chapter and it's, you know, it's typical Roman. You know, if you've ever read anything by Yeremo, it's you, you know, you'll certainly appreciate this for sure. Well, that, that's good news to hear because yeah. again, I've heard about that and I didn't know the issues because I, again, I make assumptions and things I hear, but uh, it's a, that's good to know because uh, I think that is one that's highly anticipated. And But I think mm. that goes back to what we're talking about today because of who the Black Watch is, what it went through. Even the story of writing the book is interesting to people and everything that's happened since that documentary mm. that I don't like talking about, <laughs> but that I can't shut up about. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's all part of it, I think. is it, Well, that, that doc documentary had a huge impact, whether you like it or not. I mean, yeah. the reaction, I should say, not the documentary, but the yeah. reaction to the documentary. Had well, it's hard not to talk about it in my work or with the black watch it's uh, it's nearly uh, yeah yeah exactly yeah yeah it's 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 nearly impossible so yeah so i talked about yeah having in in the shell and then second world war yeah well the shell i mean after the shell i mean the, the best thing that happens if you will to the black watch is the three month you know pause you okay. know the winter on the maws they they get a chance to absorb properly trained reinforcements or at least get a chance to properly train them, train them while they're there. In. and yeah, and they work up. And so, you know, basically you're looking at three different black watch battalions during the war. You get the one up to yeah. Verrier, the one between Verrier and of course, say the Walker and Causeway. And then the one that goes into the Reichwald in uh, February of 1945. Yeah. And some would argue that that is a much more professional and perhaps the best battalion that the black watch has ever fielded. And that's saying something when you look at the 13th, 42nd and 73rd. Okay. And um, part of it, part of the argument is they have now come to terms with the type of fighting, the the dynamic mm. texture, if you will, of, of what yeah. they're faced with. The right. fact that they're not only just training, but they're training in country, they're training at, in the front lines. Yeah. And the territorial exclusiveness that I mentioned earlier about the Black Watch, that's out the window. And right now they're just looking for the best and brightest and they don't care where they come from. Yeah, that... that you know? uh... That's another, for late, yeah. like again, the late First World War kind of thing. It's like, yeah, who cares? There's a war on kind of thing, as, as always is an excuse. For well, to, to, to give you an example, well, to give you an example of the Black Watch culture, anybody who was not raised in Black Watch traditions, it was called a stranger. In other words, <laughs> yeah, and you can see the correspondence between Hutchison and, and the officers going back, and there's a couple of them that were still around, mm -hmm. right? They'd come back after being wounded at Verrier or whatever else, yeah. and he talks about, oh, yeah, you know, for instance, uh, you know, we've got this wonderful intelligence officer. He's a man from Sudbury. His name is Bill Shea. He's a stranger, but he's good, you know? <laughs> and it, it, it was like, you know, he's he's not us, yeah. but he's the okay version, you know He'll what I mean? He'll do okay for what we got to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you can see that exclusiveness, right? That's another so. thing that gets again but that changes that's a first world war that's an inner war thing that especially an inner yeah. war thing and again the whole identity but that, that that's great and yeah this is a great question i think that kind of answers that though from alex asking about you know what 45 battles should the black watch be known for uh, well you've got moylan wood you've got hawkwald um probably getting down well grown again yeah right at the end of the war i mean that's yeah. probably the big one i mean i've I have become so enamored um, with that history, the the complexity 
mm. of what the Canadian soldiers were involved with. Um, mm. it, it's much more of a more, I mean, first of all, it's the first time as far as I can see since maybe Artona that the Canadian army are involved in any major urban setting. In and that way, yeah. Yeah, in yeah. Fact, I mean, it's the end of the war. Now, mind you, they're not going up against a determined crack German force, but well, at I the same time, they have ardent Dutch Nazis who well, are I was say, it's the Dutch the SS. Nazis because they have no place to go. No. But the other complexity here, which is interesting for the for the contemporary realm, is that it's uh, Groningen is filled with civilians. They haven't been evacuated. Yeah. So it becomes very difficult. And they have been told to eliminate what we would now call collateral damage. Yeah. And it becomes known as the door knocker campaign. Yeah. Because the idea was you didn't just go busting in and start, you know, trying to root out the Germans in the most ruthless and lethal way possible. You had to make sure that the Dutch were out of there. Yeah. Now, how difficult that is and how dangerous that is to do when you have to go around and announce your presence yeah, I know. before you clear out a house. Well, that's it's yeah, well, that's great. I think, yeah, Groningen, I think, is probably the one. I mean, yeah. but the fighting that after veritable starts and everything is I think yeah. Un, yeah. Un, un, misunderstood. It's not covered as much. I try to do as much variable stuff as I can. Agree. I'm only one person. There's but also just, Laren. Yeah, a little bit before yeah. that is Laren. Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. Yeah, and then, but everything moves so quickly. I mean, well, I was going to say, around. I mean, Groningen yeah. is the only place that they're there for several days. Yeah. You know, I think it's the 12th, 13th, 14th, roughly yeah. of, it's of very April. very close to the end. Very yeah, close. very close to the end. But yeah. it's, but, it's like, you know, yeah. the animal in the corner kind of thing. It's the Dutch SS. It's, uh, it's yeah. a whole other. Exactly. Yeah, it's a whole bunch of, like, I'd say more modern complexities to the battle than we have ever seen in, in yeah. Canadian Well, I was just said fighting insurgents. It's not yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> heavily armed insurgents. Yeah. Well, I was going to say maybe because of the civilian element, but I was going to, sorry, I wanted yeah. to say with, with, with Grown again, I get another one. And I don't, I know people are doing more work on it coming up. I, can't, I probably can't say anymore, but I know that there's different looks being done at it and people are interested in, in what that it, means. And I know there's people in the Netherlands working on this. I'm growing want to understand yeah. it better. Yeah. I had a, yeah. I had some chats with people and maybe we'll get on that maybe into the yeah. spring, but I know people wanting to look at it in that sense. But oh, again, yeah. sorry, I was going to say too, the, the photos of Groningen are so interesting because yeah. they don't, they show the front line, but not really, but there's civilians everywhere. It almost oh, looks yeah. like, it's like this typical mind's eye of yeah, cheering civilians in every Dutch city that we easily take over. And I'm like, not exactly. <laughs> it doesn't look the same, right? But it doesn't really get. Yeah, it, 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 sort reminds, of me, it reminds me of a famous photo in, in uh, Normandy where the woman comes out of her house and I think she's pouring tea to the Bren gunner. Yeah. You yeah. know, it, it's very much along those lines where the mm -hmm. Dutch are absolutely thrilled, but they're not, they understand the danger and they're not throng, you know, they're not throngs of Dutch, yeah. you know, spilling into the streets and partying because they understand the danger and what is yeah. still, you know, what is still going down. And then eventually that happens. And there's a, there, there's a bloodlust of revenge, <laughs> be, you know, because those Dutch Nazis are holding out right in the town center, right until the end, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, there's uh, yeah. that's some film that doesn't show well that specifically, but things after uh, that are yes, exactly. well, even deemed appropriate for 1945 newsreels, which I think was a little more edgy than we're probably used to today. Even so, yes. it was uh, interesting. I was just looking at that the other day, trying to find something yeah. else. But uh, anyway, yeah, it's, it's fascinating campaign. The Black Watch role in it is interesting. The whole Second Division role, it's yeah. fascinating. If anybody's yeah. going to take a look at the you know the last couple of weeks of the war that would definitely be the place to go yeah yeah well i mean yeah i'm glad that you did mention grown again and everything because i think that's like i said people are looking at it people want to bring more attention to it they want yeah. to you know have a kind of almost like cross-pollination between us and and the dutch yep. and everything which i think is amazing because we need to do more and more of that because the dutch have great resources oh, that God, we yeah. barely look at i mean I've, I've found things that people are experts and have or in regiments and have no idea what i'm talking about yeah. <laughs> because it's on a Dutch website. Uh, oh, anyway, yeah. that's a bit, of, bit of an aside, but uh, yeah. So no, the Dutch, the, it, what's going on in Holland is is amazing. I mean, the, yeah. the, the level of appreciation, I mean, and I've said this before, the Dutch understand the concept of appreciation. As yeah. a matter of fact, I think they created it. Yeah. I mean, it's just, they understand it like nothing else. And, I, you know, there are people in France and Belgium who are obviously mm -hmm. appreciative. It's just the Dutch take it to a different level. And, I, I, and the only thing I could put my finger on um, would be the fact that they were also fed by the Allies. Yeah. You know I think I mean? They weren't just liberated from a, a political ideology and a horrible master, but the basics of life were brought to them. 
And that's about the only thing that I could think of, you know, that really does. Well, that's, that's what I've read. Cause again, I, I said, I did some work what was the war museum too, or whatever, pre COVID, whatever the, whatever that was nowadays. Uh, anyway, so just reading accounts, trying to get stuff together. And it's, yeah. it was that a lot of people talked about that. It's like the Canadians brought us food. Like we knew it was them, but then they came, they were here. They came and yeah. they did it. And then they fed us again kind of thing, or they yeah. took care of us again. So exactly. it's just, it, it, it's, uh, it was very appreciative. I mean, not everything was rosy and uh, after war period but uh no, no, no. i think it's uh, a, an interesting element of that and, I, and again i'm glad you mentioned that because i think that's an area that could be better understood for a, mm. i'm not even just talking black watch i mean second no, day, no no right across across the yeah board. i mean i've had some amazing things i mean when i was there in uh, for the 70th i guess it was was it 70 or 75th 75th i guess it was about five years ago for the end of the war and um, it was the first time I had been to Holland for the VE Day celebrations. And I've never seen anything like it. I mean, we were there filming Black Watch snipers. And, um, we, you know, we had Sandy Sanderson who was there and he was up in the back of the truck. And, you know, there was four generations of Dutch that were there, you know, and infants were being hoisted yeah. up yeah. to touch the hand as if it was yeah. the Pope that had arrived, yeah. you know what I mean? And the, you know, the band was, was going to bless them. And I, I've just, ne I've never seen anything like it. Yeah, and it's it was, amazing. It, it, oh, it was wonderful. Absolutely it's, wonderful. It, it's like, yeah, it's like it just happened, right? You know, it's just like VE Day just happened or the liberation had just happened, which, no, God, and yeah. again, other people are not appreciative, not, they are appreciative in other parts, but it's just for some reason, it's, I think it has to do with the, the hunger winter. And That's if you've never heard, like, if you've never looked into that, yeah. sorry, just to decide for anyone, yeah. you, there's some stuff out there and some accounts and some re and some work being done on it that is amazing. And it'll, even if you understand the basics of the hunger winter, you hear these things and it's just yeah. mind blowing awful uh anyway sorry sorry to cut you off oh, I, I i would certainly argue it's canada's finest moment period yeah. you know regardless of what part of history and we've had some wonderful moments i think you know when you you know put your life on the line go liberate somebody and then feed them yeah it's big you know job anyway, done. anyway well there, there's our rabbit hole i guess that was inevitable there we go uh, <laughs> I said it was inevitable, so no one can. Uh... Don't stop saying rabbit hole because Colin's drunk now. Oh, he's uh, he might be dead. He doesn't <laughs> say anything in a while. He might just be dead or passed out at this point. He's probably passed um, out by this time. Yeah. <laughs> he's probably passed out. <laughs> uh, anyway, so yeah, that I think that does a good thing. I mean, doing the Black Watch, we already touched on it throughout. You know, after the war, and I don't want to talk about unification because it just gets people's well, blood. <laughs> too much they would does, do that yeah time. they were regular force they went off they yeah. sent a battalion to korea in 53 um came back they were in you know in in west germany part of nato you know on the front lines there they were in uh god i i, I don't think they were there as a unit in cyprus but they certainly said no. then and then finally you know came along the budget cuts and uh you know the amalgamation and they they got the chop they were a standing regular force unit mm -hmm. until 1970 when they were disbanded and sent back as a reserve unit which they are today and again that gets back to our discussion how you know there was there was somebody last week and you know they were reading something about some quote i made about the most storied regiment in the canadian army and they said well wait a second no that's the ppcli and i said well <laughs> Now it is. <laughs> you now. Know what I mean? now it may be. Yeah. Uh -huh. But traditionally it was the Black Watch. And and like I said, that takes nothing away from any of the other regiments. No, it was no, no, just, no. you know, it's suddenly when you're, you know, when you have as many men as the Black Watch did, when you have 46 battle honors, when you have, yeah. you know, six Victoria Crosses, and you are cut from a cloth that generally is stoic. But the attitude kind of announces its announces itself where yeah, you go. That's a good way to put it. Politely, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. You don't necessarily have to s explain what the Black Watch is when you know it's like you don't have to explain what the Montreal Canadiens are. Yeah, you know, maybe this year, but that's beside yeah, yeah. the point. This year doesn't exist, in my opinion. No, it doesn't exist. No, uh, no, no I no. can't even watch it. I get too angry. Uh, anyway, <laughs> my dad still watches, and I'm like, "Why are you doing this to yourself?" Uh, okay. Anyway, we know it's going to end poorly, but anyway, uh, sorry. Yeah, I just that's you said it well. Yeah, it's that air, but again, it's not taking away, but that's showing the change. I think that's important that you talked about this off. Yeah, the Montreal it, it, plays into this. It's how the country has changed. Big time. How the yes, Canadian Army has right. changed. These yep. things move and change. It's not. Never thing yep. is never set in stone here. And I think yep. maybe Black Watch is a perfect 
Well, it's interesting because it does correlate. I mean, there is a correlation, I suppose, you know, between the Black Watch being, you know, downsized or relegated. And of course, the the shift of Montreal losing that center of gravity and having it move west to Toronto. It's all around the same time. It's all around starting around 1970. Which I think plays a big role, and then and then Alex makes another excellent point: being reg force does a lot, <laughs> right? Big time in this day and age. Oh yeah, of course, I mean, of course. RCR... And that's why I'm saying, you know, that's why I said, yeah, in this day and age, if you want to talk about storied regiments, then by all means, you're talking about the PCLI or the RCR or whatever yeah. else. Um, but up until 1970, you know, I don't think anybody can argue that anything came close. Maybe the Queen's Own, uh, you know, maybe some, you know, one or two others, but nothing along those lines. You know, when it yeah. comes to being like a storied regiment. Well, and uh, and and again, King guards, yeah. He's still going by his his moniker, but Dave saying <laughs> like yeah. the Queen's Own. It's it is a good point. There's a lot there um, about yeah. The- no, he's British. he's definitely right, without a doubt. Yeah, there was uh, the Black Watch has always, um, particularly in the officer corps. Have had a, an affinity for the royals. Yeah, you know? yeah. There's no doubt. Yeah, about that. and that's a whole other thing. Yeah. I won't say the forbidden word. I won't say it, but that's a whole other yeah. path. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> too. Not traditionally, not traditionally francophone. It was always anglophone. Uh, now it's completely changed. I mean, I you know I was in the meeting the other day. Um, you know, and the the former CEO, uh, Colonel Bruno Plourde, had just handed off to Colonel Francis Wah, <laughs> you know, yeah. which was unheard of, absolutely unheard of. I mean, it only took 150 years, but you know, yeah, yeah. get there eventually. Yeah, well, that's much. Still reality. waiting for the first female yeah. commanding uh, officer. Yeah, yeah. I'm not holding my long breath. overdue. Sorry. No offense, Black Watch, but I'm not holding my breath with you. Guys. Long overdue. And because we just spent the last hour and 16 minutes talking about why that is the case. Yeah, the exactly. Place. Yeah. That's just, we're historians. Just, we observe look, the, and the we early comment history, on what we see. Yeah. The early history of the regiment is probably just about as stereotypical as you can think about, oh, you know, when you talk about old Anglo Montreal. Oh yeah. Geez. You know? If you need, I would, again, we're obviously the two of us are biased with our military historian background, but if I would be like, how do you explain Canada at that time? I'd probably use the Black Watch and then talk about the, you know, the NHL head office being moved from Montreal out of the country. Like, I mean, if you had to, you know, make tangible things, yeah. like that's what you could do. Because again, yeah. I, I had to be explaining this when I was a kid growing up near Toronto, but as a French Canadian, being yeah. like Montreal was the center. And I went, that's, yeah. what are you talking about? Like my mom and dad be like, what are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense. But they're like, this is not, there's no Pearson. This isn't the Toronto of today. Like this is different. So I think it's, it's just really interesting way of understanding Canada and yeah, it is. understanding. It's a, yeah. It's a very yeah. interesting approach to take. Yeah. With it. Yeah. And I mean, it, it talks about, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think over their dead bodies, Dave, sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't see that. happening. Yeah. I, maybe the, maybe, maybe the retired general would like to propose that officially. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll see. We want to have another post unit type unification fight. Let's do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway. Uh, yeah, that was great. I think we're good for time. Um, lots of good uh, conversation on the side chat, which is always amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I'm sorry if we missed questions. Sorry about that. We can't answer everything. Cause I do have to start. I have to run. So uh, unfortunately I got to get out of here, but I actually have somewhere to be for once. Uh, which is different for me, but uh, <laughs> I can actually leave the house just to go out for dinner and a uh, fiance's parents. Wow. So I, I do. Wow. Out. I know. Right. Living the big life. Day parole. Or... Sorry. You're on day parole. I take it. You get a chance to get out on one day, right? You're being paroled. You're allowed out of the bunker. You're oh, no, I'm going to meet the, the family. I'm going to meet going, the Yeah, yeah no, but it sounds like that. I mean, we've all been stuck. I mean, I'm sitting yeah. in my bunker. and Oh, know. we just, we're both, we, our family, like the two of us, her parents, we might as well just still be in that quarantine when they, they were still talking yeah. about groups intermingling. That's, we don't, we work from home, so we don't really see yeah. anyone. And we're locked down in the city as it is, which I don't want to talk about, but uh, <laughs> Uh, oh, we have a question. I believe you got a yeah, the, the dog, right? Still a name, Winnie. Ah, Winnie's on her way. She hasn't arrived yet. Okay. Um, D Day or W Day, I suppose, is uh, <laughs> two weeks. Two weeks from yesterday, so uh, we're counting down. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll be filming the arrival and the meeting. I was going to say. Coffee. The uh, the the chaos. I'm sure will be on Twitter. It will be. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Without a doubt. Yeah. yeah I, I remember those days. My wife, my wife talked me into it. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, I really, I, I put up a hell of a fight. Uh, um, I'm sure, I'm sure you did. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I've been there yeah, myself. I did. Uh, I yeah, but Pop, Poppy needs a little friend. That's yeah. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. So Winnie will be arriving within uh, 13 days. So. There we go. And Norma, yes, you can expect video. So, um, oh, of course. I think there has to be at this point. Uh, you can't advertise and then uh, leave us hanging. <laughs> <laughs> I know it won't. <laughs> anyway, I'll just do a quick sign off and then uh, come back and we'll okay. say bye before we sign off. Bye, everybody. Oh, you'll be back. Just give me a minute. Oh, I will. Oh, yes. Thanks. Yeah, go okay. anywhere. Give me a minute here. All right. So thanks everyone for watching. Appreciate it. Uh, and again, our long ranging discussions as me and, and, and Dave have as these things happen, as we love the topics, we love talking this stuff. So we'll keep going until one of us makes the other shut up. So, which is what you love to watch. So thanks everyone for coming out and uh, all the great questions and everything. I'm going to have uh, Dave back at some point. I don't know. I got to figure out my plans. Uh, just a little update in the next week or so. Don't expect anything. Sorry. This next week and a bit is going to be crazy for me. I got too much other things to do. So the channel is probably going to be quiet for the next little while, unfortunately, but then I'll uh, get it revved up once things calm down, uh, hopefully. Uh, but that said, please do like, support the channel in any way you can. Subscribing does a huge, huge help, as do comments below afterwards. And the Patreon, as always, uh, check that out. That, again, is going to be, sorry, a little dormant in the next little while, but uh, probably the next week or two weeks or so. But once that's over, I'm uh, expecting things to get firing on all cylinders again and have lots of good stuff. So if you can become a patron, that's great, uh, or any other support. is Everything's linked below. So is Dave's Twitter if you're not following them. I don't know how, but uh, <laughs> you probably are if you're here. Uh, so please do do that. And, again, uh, thanks again for watching. And... Um, Internet's fighting me always at the end. Thanks again for coming on. I really appreciate that. Oh, thanks and for having me. Thanks for we'll get, coming out, everybody. Yeah, thanks for everyone. Yeah, your uh, people are always going to come out to watch uh, you talk about stuff. So, we will we will plan. So, I do want to do something with you for the the, the town on the French coast that shall not be named uh, in the future. <laughs> again, I just got to get some more uh, more time to get to dig through the book you sent me. I still haven't had a chance to look at it. Yeah, so. sure. Yeah, no but, problem. Uh, that is coming. I hope I want to give everyone that kind of to look forward to. We'll get something about that probably in sometime in the summer. Maybe we'll see. Yeah. Anyway, anyone, anyway, thanks for watching and uh, I'll see you when we get back. So check out the social channels for when I come back on the channel. See everybody.